Hello, everyone, and welcome to the first of our Zoom-based webinars for the 2023-24 academic year. My name is Professor Ann Kargosian, and it is my privilege as the director of the UCLA Promise Armenian Institute to welcome you as well to the first lecture provided to us by a recently supported Promise Armenian Institute PhD dissertation year fellow recipient. Uh, that is from the last academic year. This lecture is entitled, How Western Armenian Came to Be, A Story of People, Purism, and Global Ideas, presented by Dr. Jennifer Manukian. Dr. Manukian completed her PhD in 2023 in the UCLA Department of Near Eastern Languages and Cultures as I mentioned, with partial support from a Promise Armenian Institute dissertation year fellowship. And she is now a, a UC President's postdoctoral fellow at UC Irvine. Dr. Manukian will provide for us an overview of her research, which explores the spread of standard Western Armenian as a spoken language in the post-genocide diaspora. This is a fascinating subject that is relevant to so many of us whose grandparents, great-grandparents, or even parents uh, were Armenian genocide survivors. We are also delighted to welcome to our virtual stage Professor Peter Cowie, the UCLA Narekatsi Professor of Armenian Studies and Dr. Manukian's PhD dissertation advisor. For today's webinar, I am grateful to note the co-sponsorship by the Narekatsi Chair in Armenian Studies, the UCLA Center for World Languages, the National Association for Armenian Studies and Research, or Nasser, and the Ararat Eskijin Museum. And on behalf of the co-sponsors here at UCLA, I would like to acknowledge our presence on the traditional, ancestral, and unceded territory of the indigenous Gabriela, Gabrielino Tongva peoples. And especially at this moment in Armenian history, I would like to express on behalf of our UCLA Promise Armenian Institute family, our deep horror and sorrow at the violent actions of Azerbaijan against the indigenous Armenians of Artsakh or Nagorno-Karabakh, first through a nine month blockade of the Lachin Corridor, as you, most of you know, which is the sole mountain road linking the region to Armenia, resulting in a humanitarian crisis marked by starvation and health deprivation, and then through an unprovoked military attack on Artsakh itself on September 19, resulting in the loss of hundreds of lives and the injury and maiming of hundreds of others. This resulted in the near complete ethnic cleansing of indigenous Armenians, over 100,000 souls from their ancestral homeland of Artsakh. At this time, numerous ethnic Armenians, many of them former leaders in the Artsakh government have been arrested by Azerbaijan for the crime of daring to serve their people who have lived in this region for millennia. We express our horror and condemnation of all acts of violent aggression against civilian populations now and then in the future and express our heartfelt support for our Armenian brothers and sisters who have suffered so much. And now back to our webinar. My colleague, Professor Peter Cowie will provide a formal introduction for our speaker in a moment. But let me know that for those of you watching live via the Zoom webinar platform, you have an opportunity to send questions to us by clicking on the Q&A button at the bottom portion of your screen and typing in your question. Please be sure to be as specific and succinct as possible in your questions, and we will direct as many of the questions as are practical to our speaker when she is finished. We anticipate that the webinar itself will take around 45 minutes, after which we will begin the Q&A portion of the event. Also, please note that this event is being recorded for future viewing at our Promise Armenian Institute website and YouTube channel. And in the unlikely event that this Zoom webinar drops for any reason, 
please just connect right back to the same link as it will put you back into our Zoom session. <clears throat> and now it gives me great pleasure to turn the event over to Dr. Manukian's former PhD advisor, Professor Peter Cowie. Professor Cowie is the Nadekatsi Professor of Armenian Studies at UCLA and has taught at the Hebrew University of Jerusalem, the University of Chicago, and at Columbia University. His research interests include medieval Armenian history, modern Armenian nationalism, and Armenian film and theater. Professor Cowie is the author of five books and the editor of four others. He is a regular contributor to Armenological journals and has received a grant from the National Council on Eurasian and East European Research to investigate the post-Soviet publishing industry in the Republic of Armenia. And as a professor in the Department of Near Eastern Languages and Cultures at UCLA, Professor Cowie teaches numerous courses in modern Eastern Armenian language, classical Armenian language or Kudapad, literature, and a host of other subjects. So Peter, I will now turn the webinar over to you. Thank you very much, Anne, for your uh, kind introduction. Uh, it is my great pleasure to introduce today's speaker, Dr. Jennifer Manugian. Dr. Manugian is currently holder of a prestigious University of California President's Postdoctoral Fellowship at the University of California, Irvine. Her research examines Ottoman Armenian social and intellectual history, particularly the history of language practices and ideologies. She earned her PhD from the University of California, Los Angeles in spring 2023 from the Department of Near Eastern Languages and Cultures, where her research was funded by a Kalust Gulbenkian Fellowship, together with partial support from a Promise Armenian Institute Dissertation Year Fellowship. A prolific young scholar and sought-after translator, she is presently engaged in a project exploring the spread of standard West Armenian as a spoken language in the post-genocide diaspora. The topic of her presentation today is How Western Armenian Came to Be, a story of people, purism, and global ideas. Dr. Manugian, the floor is yours. Thank you, Professor Cowie, and thank you to the Promise Armenian Institute for organizing this event and for um, awarding me the dissertation year fellowship last year. Uh, that fellowship gave me the rare gift of time with very few other distractions to not only read, research, and translate for this project, but also to sit with my ideas, to disentangle them, and to, to put them to paper a very all-consuming, time-consuming, and, uh, and labor-intensive process. It's the result of all of that time and, and that labor that I'll be talking to you about today. Uh, a project on the history of a language like this one is bound to have an endless number of details and fun facts to share, but to make sure that I make the best use of my time and in hopes that everybody, no matter if they know Armenian or not, will get something out of the presentation. I'm choosing to focus on the broad strokes of my topic, how Western Armenian came to be, and on some of the larger surprises about the history that I found over the course of my research. Now, during the presentation, I'll be using a few terms pretty consistently. So I'd like to define them at the outset, so we're all on the same page so that we all understand the same things by them. The first is Western Armenian. This may seem uh, pretty self-explanatory, pretty basic. Western Armenian is the counterpart to Eastern Armenian, the form of Armenian used in Armenia. But people today uh, use the term Western Armenian in two different ways. It's used both to describe the dozens of dialects of Armenian once spoken in Western Armenia or the Ottoman Empire, and it's used to refer to the standard form of Armenian developed in the Ottoman Empire, and then later written, spoken, and taught in diaspora. I'll be using Western Armenian just in that second sense to describe only the standard language and discuss how it came into being. 
The second is language ideology. This is a technical term. It comes from the fields of linguistic anthropology, but it's used to describe something that we all know, that we all nurture in the privacy of our own minds as individuals, and something that we often share as linguistic communities. It's a collective way of thinking and feeling about the way a language is used, and more commonly about how it ought to be used. And then finally, uh, the language ideology I'll be talking about most today is the ideology of purism. This is a belief that a language can have impurities and that it can and should be stripped of them in order to achieve a clean or pristine form of language. This is a very pervasive ideology among Armenian speakers today, so pervasive that it may seem like it's always been this way, that Armenian speakers have always thought this way. But as we'll see, uh, purism among Armenian speakers is really only a few centuries old, and its emergence is tied to particular social forces. When a Western Armenian speaker today is told not to use Turkish or Arabic or English words in their Armenian, this is an example of the ideology of purism in action. And I'll be talking at length about how Armenian speakers came to think and police language in this way. Because ultimately what I'm arguing in this study is that purism played a fundamental role in the formation of Western Armenian. And that the idea of what was considered pure was determined by very human, very fallible people whose opinions changed dramatically under the influence of global movements in vogue during their lifetimes. The decisions, beliefs, and philosophies of these people uh, who I call the architects of Western Armenian, are still very much imprinted on the way Armenian is used and thought about today. At this point in my research, it's sort of hard for me to keep from seeing the fingerprints of, of all of these architects on the way Armenian speakers express themselves, and especially on the way uh, speakers understand what constitutes proper Armenian today. I hope that as you're listening, you'll be able to see that many aspects of Western Armenian language culture today, including the focus on purity, have their origins in this history. And that um, what we may think of as very modern concerns have actually been preoccupying Armenian intellectuals for centuries. These unexpected parallels between past and present are in part why I find this history so fascinating and worthwhile studying. And I hope that you'll find something familiar and intriguing in it too. Now, I always enjoy hearing how researchers arrive at their very specific topics that they spend significant periods of their lives studying. So I'd like to start with how this project came to be. This one has been a long time in the making. It's one that I came to on parallel tracks, both as a student of Western Armenian and later as a translator of Western Armenian. I should say that Armenian for me is an acquired language. It's one that I learned in a classroom. An Armenian last name didn't uh, come with a knowledge of the language for me. Parts of my family have been in the United States for, for over a century. And like many immigrants to the US, knowledge of the language quickly faded as the generations passed. This is all to say that I come to this project as a quasi outsider and as a non-native speaker. I'd like to think that this status helps me take less for granted and to see the language and the social forces that affect its use with more probing and maybe questioning inquisitive eyes than someone who grew up with the language. Being a newcomer to Armenian though did have its challenges and some of the challenges are at the root of this project. When I was first introduced to Armenian in the classroom, it was the highest register of the standard language that I was taught and encouraged to use both in writing and in speech. What I didn't realize then was I was being taught to speak an aspirational kind of language. One that had found great success in books and in newspapers since the mid 19th century, but not as much success in families and daily life. As an undergrad, I was often taught to conjugate verbs and decline nouns and use words in ways that sounded very stilted and sometimes very pretentious to the ears of many native speakers. Specifically paired away in the classroom were many results of language contact, words that uh, trace their origins to Turkish, French, and Arabic that are so prevalent in spoken Armenian, but that are entirely absent from the written language and from all dictionaries. These differences uh, left me with a lot of questions, and I amassed only more questions once I started spending more of my free time translating literature from Western Armenian. 
What I saw when I was ensnarled in sentences from the late 19th and early 20th centuries ran counter to the assumption that the influence of other languages had been entirely expelled from written Armenian. While I could rely on Armenian dictionaries to define individual words, I needed Turkish and French dictionaries to decipher many of the idiomatic expressions and turns of phrase that my writers would use. It was clear that many of them were thinking in Turkish or they were thinking in French and they were writing in Armenian, giving ways to deep structural parallels that could easily go unseen by casual readers, but that were glaring to a translator. What was going on here? How did standard Armenian come to be a repository of these influences? And why were they not more not widely acknowledged? It was only over the course of my research for this study that I was able to slowly piece together satisfying answers to these questions. Having uncovered the multilingual universe that these late Ottoman and early diasporan writers inhabited, alongside a sweeping multi-century, multifocal purist campaign aimed at curbing the influence of other languages on Armenian. These experiences led me to the following broad questions that guide my study. First, who were the architects of Western Armenian? Who were the people involved? Why was the formation of Western Armenian so contentious? Why did new beliefs about language arise? Why was interaction with other languages resisted? Why did the definition of purity change over time? And then finally, how has this history shaped today's practices? These are very simple, very basic questions, but ones that haven't been asked before. And by the end of the presentation, we should have working answers to each of them. There are certainly no shortage of studies on the Armenian language, but this one differs in three ways from what's already out there. It differs in its approach and its perspective and in its source base. A lot of important work has been done on the history of Armenian, especially in Europe and Armenia, uh, but these are often on a very granular, very micro level, having to do with linguistic features, language structures, word origins, patterns of sound and grammatical change that are difficult to understand for those of us outside the disciplines of philology or historical linguistics. Macro level sociolinguistic studies or social histories of Armenian like this one, those that look at how people and their social environments had an impact on language use, those are much fewer and further between. The second is the perspective. The study takes into account both the global and the local, meaning that while I look at internal dynamics among Armenians in the Ottoman Empire, I also take into account the global ideas that Armenians were interacting with, ideas that span borders and that were adopted and adapted by Armenian intellectuals in a variety of ways. And as we'll see, they had a huge impact on the way Western Armenian came to be. Finally, existing studies on Armenian tend to use mostly linguistic evidence as their source base, so individual words, sound changes, uh, while I rely heavily on commentaries about language from the people who lived through these periods. For this, I read a lot of newspapers from the periods, I read a lot of books from the period, and there was a never-ending supply of commentary, often complaints about how language was used and especially how it was changing. It's from those complaints and commentaries that I draw my conclusions about the social forces that brought Western Armenian into being. So as I was reading through these commentaries about language, four surprising phenomena emerged that I hadn't expected at the start of my research. These phenomena form the social backdrop of the emergence of Western Armenian. So it's critical to understand them in order to understand the context the architects of Western Armenian were working in, what they were resisting, and what they were developing their ideologies around. The first is, is that uh, not all Armenians spoke Armenian. If anyone in the audience remembers a parent or a grandparent born in the Ottoman Empire who didn't know Armenian, this might not be very surprising to you at all, but uh, much of this memory in later generations has faded over time. Today, uh, speaking Armenian is considered an essential component of Armenian identity. But the language in Armenian spoke before the 19th century was not always invested with the same importance as it has today. The languages Armenians spoke in daily life had little bearing on their identity and were rarely policed or regulated before the 19th century. 
Sometimes their primary language was a dialect of Armenian, but many times it was another language entirely. In this way, uh, there were large segments of the Ottoman Empire where communities of Armenians had little to no knowledge of any form of Armenian and had adopted Turkish, Kurdish, Arabic, or other languages as their main and sometimes only language. This linguistic diversity became a source of tremendous anxiety and concern among the intelligentsia during the 19th century, particularly once the national movement created the expectation that one nation should speak one language. The second is that not all Armenians gave value to Armenian. Given the great respect for Armenians, Armenian today among its speakers, it may be difficult to imagine a time where the Armenian language wasn't widely revered or even cherished by its speakers. But the reality is that the intellectuals in my study toiled for decades to create the sense of reverence and adoration that now dominates. Unlike its status and not unlike its status in the Armenian diaspora today, Armenian in the Ottoman Empire was a non-dominant language. It had limited domains of use, it was wielded by multilingual people, and it was largely confined to communication among Armenians. Because of this, it was in direct competition with the other languages in a speaker's repertoire, and would often be dismissed by its own speakers as useless because of it. Whereas today, a national ideology props up Armenian and gives it an ideological significance that impels Armenians to use it and perpetuate it, despite its lack of utility, the language had little inherent draw in the pre and early national periods and was widely considered inferior to other languages in a speaker's repertoire. Number three is that few Armenians spoke purely in the past. And by purely in quotes, I mean that few spoke Armenian with no words integrated in it from the other languages around them. There's a misconception today that Armenian speakers long ago knew and used clean Armenian, makur hayren, in all domains of life, and that they did not rely on words from the dominant languages around them like speakers do today. Many today believe that the loss of purity is a consequence of the post-genocide diaspora. But the same linguistic complaints, the same complaints about impure language, about linguistic decline, resounded in the Ottoman period as well. Just like today, Armenians in the past also needed to be taught and invent the Armenian words for certain objects or concepts that they only knew in another one of their languages. Since the advent of the ideology of purism, using pure Armenian has always been an exception, an ideal, an aspiration, never the historical norm that today's speakers have been led to believe it is. Finally, it's crucial to know that in daily life, Armenians navigated not only between different languages, but also between different varieties of Armenian. Many um, varieties of Armenian, many in the audience today might know from experience that the variety of Armenian used in the Armenian Apostolic or Armenian Catholic Church services differs from the variety of Armenian used elsewhere. But in Ottoman times, this variation was much more multifaceted. At its most basic, there was a rigid division between classical Armenian, a form that people might know as Kurapar or church Armenian. This was used in writing and Armenian dialects used in, used in speech. As we find in many language communities around the world, there was no assumption that the written and the spoken language would or should be one and the same. Until the late 19th century, classical Armenian had been the only codified form of Armenian, the only form of Armenian with dictionaries and grammar books, and it had been used in nearly all literary genres, in education, and in most written communication. But classical Armenian, a language of the learned, was inaccessible to the vast majority of the population, who were largely illiterate, and if Armenian speaking, spoke dialects of Armenian that varied by region, and that were distinct from the classical language in its grammar, in their grammar and, and vocabulary. What's unique about the period of this study, the 18th and the 19th centuries, is that we see a new intermediate form of Armenian emerge, one that displayed features of both the classical language and the spoken dialect of the Ottoman capital. Over the course of the 19th century, this variety of Armenian assumed nearly all the functions that classical Armenian had occupied for centuries. By the turn of the century, classical Armenian had been relegated to the church, 
Western Armenian reigned as the primary language of writing and regional dialects continued to be used in speech alongside other local languages. In this way, Armenian dialects were not crushed by the rise of Western Armenian at first, and they continued to carry out their longstanding function until the end of the Ottoman period. Contrary to popular belief and to my own surprise, Western Armenian was primarily a language of print and it was not widely spoken during the Ottoman period. It was an acquired language learned at school and through the press and it existed alongside regional dialects. Okay, so this study has three basic premises that have uh, commonly not been taken into account in the study of Armenian. The first is that purism is a malleable ideology. It's not an inherent aspect of all language communities. To understand this, we might draw on our experience as English speakers. Very rarely do or ever do we hear about uh, using pure English, but the, con the idea of using pure Armenian really permeates today. So purism in the form of resistance to Turkish borrowings, among others, is a defining feature of the Ottoman approach to written language. I'll talk about that in a little, in a little while. And the ideology, which was cultivated in the 18th century, dominates to this day. I don't need to tell anyone that. Uh, second is that standards are engineered. So people create written languages. And people's attitudes, prejudices, and preferences are embedded in those standards. So the Western Armenian standard is the result of, of fairly arbitrary decisions made by the 18th and 19th century intellectual elite. And I'll give you some examples in just a little while. The final uh, premise is that social context is key. So language is a barometer of social change. The kinds of words deemed impure and targeted for removal depend on the social climate. Similarly, the kinds of words deemed pure and idealized depend on the social climate. So this gets us to our social movements. There we go. Here I argue that four movements gave rise to the emergence and transformation of the concept of purism among Ottoman Armenians. These also guided ideas about what was deemed pure and consequently what was included and excluded from Western Armenia in the making. In this final part of the presentation, I'll go through these movements uh, one by one. And our first one, uh, our first foundational and most enduring movement is humanism. Here we find ourselves in Venice on the island of San Lazzaro. Uh, this is the home of the Armenian Catholic Mkhitaryan congregation who inaugurated the idea of purism among the Ottoman Armenian intelligentsia in the mid 1700s and penned the first text in the early form of a language that we now call today Western Armenian. I can't emphasize enough how truly transformational the work of the Mkhitaryan monks was in this regard. They not only sparked a new and enduring obsession with linguistic purity, but they also framed classical Armenian as the ultimate source of purity. As the earliest and most prolific writers to publish in this form, the congregation's monks formulated language ideologies that would then be taken up, developed, and resisted by various waves of intellectuals in the centuries to come. Shaping attitudes about appropriate language use, this ideology manifested most strikingly in a hostility to borrowings from other languages which would become a near universal fixation among writers and uh, intellectuals, arguably to this day. While in later decades, linguistic purism would be co-opted by groups with different agendas, at its root, purism did not emerge as part of a romantic nationalist drive to assert a sense of national authenticity, as we might assume. But rather, it was a practical tool to help realize the congregation's larger humanist project to correct and perfect language. So for those of you who have heard of humanism before, you might associate it with the European Renaissance. But elements of humanism were still alive and well in the 18th century, where Mkhitar, and this is Mkhitar in the corner, and his congregation settled uh, after fleeing the Ottoman Empire, where they were persecuted for their Catholicism, persecuted by Armenians for their Catholicism. For our purposes, it's useful to hone in on humanism as a turning to or an idealization of an ancient past. 
This helps us to understand how and why the Mkhitaryan monks saw purism as a worthwhile ideal to pursue. Their project had a couple of parts. One, steeped in human humanism, the congregation grew frustrated with the status quo of classical Armenian, which they thought had become corrupted in the 18th century. Like humanists before them, European humanists before them, the monks compiled sources from the past that they thought represented the purest form of classical Armenian. And this had done before, this had been done before um, in other European circles, most notably with Latin. So they collected a corpus of materials. This is something that in the dissertation I call the forebearer canon. Um, and they framed them as representing the purest classical Armenian. This is a select group of texts written between the 5th and the 12th centuries. Third, the congregation created grammar books and dictionaries based on the materials found in these texts, and they started to cultivate the idea that their pure humanist classical Armenian was a point of unity, that it had the power to unite Armenian across confession and geography. Fragmentation, social fragmentation among Armenians was a very um, palpable social concern at this time in the 18th century. Now, this is where we start to see an early form of Western Armenian come into the picture. The congregation knew that very few Armenians knew classical Armenian. So because of this new ideological importance, they needed to devise strategies to help people learn it. What they did is they took the native, their native dialect of Armenian, Mkhitar was famously, Mkhitar Sepastatsi is famously from Sepastia, but many of the monks in his congregation were from Constantinople, and many of the early writers of these texts were from Constantinople. So they took their native dialect of Armenian, they removed all of the Turkish borrowings commonly uh, used in it, and they replaced them with humanist classical Armenian equivalents, all of those words that they had collected from those sources. In this new form of Armenian, they published a limited corpus of books, mostly school books, devotional books, and um, a trio of newspapers. And this is how purism emerged and how Western Armenian emerged alongside it. Purism, in other words, stemmed from the larger Mkhitaryan humanist project to purify classical Armenian. And what we know is Western Armenian emerged not in an attempt to develop a new or modern language that would rival classical Armenian, but rather as a practical teaching tool in hopes of guiding Armenians directly to the classical language. That's clearly not how it turned out. And it's because of their ideology of purism and the form of Armenian that the Mkhitaryans developed um, that was taken up by a new set of intellectuals with their own agendas and used for purposes that the Mkhitaryans had originally not intended. So this brings us to our next global movement, cultural nationalism. It is likely, uh, this is likely the movement that we are all the most familiar with because we're still living in uh, the paradigm that the cultural nationalists created. This is a worldview in which to be a good Armenian means to know Armenian and to speak Armenian purely. This was an invention of the 1840s. Among cultural nationalists, we find now purism cloaked in this new discourse of cultural nationalism as language comes to be conceived first and foremost as the ultimate symbol of a new national identity. To use words from other languages was no longer ordinary or commonplace as it had once been, but it was now the ultimate sign that the speaker was lazy, uneducated, and especially uh, nation-hating. This was a word that came, comes up quite a lot in the sources, askadiats. Under the influence of this new movement, we see cultural nationalists re-articulate and reinterpret the work of the Mkhitaryan congregation. We see them adopt what their bridge to classical Armenian was as a national language and transform Mkhitaryan purism from a teaching tool into a national duty. This is a period around the world where nation building is in full swing and nation builders are trying to devise elements that will distinguish their nation from others around them. A modern language is commonly drawn upon in this pursuit and in the Armenian context, it's no different. The issue is that most intellectuals were ambivalent about abandoning classical Armenian for a modern language. They believed as the Mkhitaryans had told them that classical Armenian was an essential point of unity 
among Armenians and that its loss would lead to the loss of Armenian nationhood. They were also actively cultivating classical Armenian as a source of national dignity, of national distinctiveness. And within the movement, they were using classical Armenian to combat those negative attitudes that I mentioned earlier, those negative attitudes towards Armenians, towards Armenian among Armenian speakers themselves. Even the most enthusiastic reformers believed that the best way to help Western Armenian become a modern national language was to draw it as close as possible to classical Armenian. This meant an intensification of purist intervention into the language, going after Turkish words still in use with increased intensity. By ridding the language of Turkish words, the architects of Western Armenian, all nationally minded men, believed that they could combat negative attitudes towards Armenian and create a fully national national language that Armenians would want to use and to be proud of. This certainly didn't happen in their lifetimes, uh, but it really never ceases to amaze me how amazed they would be if they could see how much their ideologies took hold in the 20th and the 21st centuries. Okay, so starting in the 1860s, we see a slow shift in conceptions of purity and we enter a radically new linguistic paradigm. While classical Armenian was seen nearly exclusively as the epitome of purity for a century, Beginning around 1860, we find this perspective contested for the first time, as individuals begin advocating for giving value to words used in spoken varieties of Armenian instead. Here's where we see intellectuals begin toying with the idea that Western Armenian could be its own independent language distinct from classical Armenian. For the first time, the educated spoken usage of the Ottoman capital, rather than classical written usage, starts to rise in prestige and rival classical Armenian as a source of enrichment for the new standardizing language. Why did this happen? How did the authority of classical Armenian come to be contested? This change, I would argue, is connected to a growing awareness among a new generation of intellectuals of theories about the origin and nature of language. These come from academics in Europe and the United States, comparative philologists by trade, who begin to give new value to spoken language generally. Advocates for the development of Western Armenian or modern Armenian, as it was called then, used these new ideas to invent new defenses for the language and to overcome the intellectual ambivalence over whether to cling to classical Armenian or to develop modern Armenian. What they did was they used the latest research in comparative philology to interrogate three long held beliefs that had undergirded the primacy of classical Armenian and maintained the subordination of even the concept of a modern Armenian. These beliefs were that one, classical Armenian was divine and God given. This was very common to hear before the 1860s. The second is that spoken Armenian, uh, the spoken Armenian on which modern Armenian was based, was just a corruption or a degenerate form of classical Armenian, also very common. And three, that classical Armenian was pure, that it contained no borrowings from other languages. These were all, none of these were true, and exposing these beliefs as myths with the help of the research of of those comparative philologists finally breaks the centuries old spell. Of, of classical Armenian. It gives new value to the concept of a modern Armenian and helps legitimize modern Armenian in its own, um, as a language in its own right, distinct from classical Armenian. It also makes it so that intellectuals no longer located purity in old classical texts, but rather in their own spoken Armenian as urban educated writers, what they would call the language of the people. Now, under the influence of our final movement, which which takes us up to the genocide, the language of the people takes on a new meaning. At this point, the eye of national thought is focused on the Ottoman provinces and intellectuals from outside urban centers enter the fray to challenge the idea that classical usage and the usage of urban writers should be the only sources of purity for standard Western Armenian. This is a radical new approach to purity and it's guided by the slow rise of scholarly and popular interest 
in what was called uneducated speech, provincial variety and, and prov provincial varieties of Armenian. Under the influence of this new folkloristic movement, folk culture, one uh, supposedly untouched by contaminants of urban life, that's how it was framed, becomes the purest expression of national identity. In this way, uh, this way of thinking permeated many aspects of Ottoman Armenian culture at the time. We see it in dance and music, but for our purposes, it's significant that for the first time we see intellectuals living and working in the Ottoman provinces, framing their own spoken dialects of Armenian as the most authentic resources for the nascent Western Armenian standard. At this time, they set about collecting and publishing lists of terms that they've found in their own um, Armenian dialect and advocating for replacing many of what they call inauthentic neologisms or newly coined words and gallicisms, words patterned on French, that they were reading in the press, that they were reading and writing penned by urbanites. They advocated for replacing those with what they're framing as pure authentic Armenian terms from their own dialects. Despite the ethos of the day, urban elites were ultimately the gatekeepers to the standard language and their own prejudices against provincial dialects prevail. This means that provincial dialects ultimately had a very limited impact on shaping the vocabulary of the standard language. Terms from provincial dialects were drawn upon only selectively in the burst of dictionaries of Western Armenian produced in the 1890s and the 1900s. But they were nevertheless of critical significance in the drive to elevate modern Armenian to the status of a fully fledged national language and to assert its distinctiveness from classical Armenian. So this is the blend of influences we ultimately find in the vocabulary of standard Western Armenian today. The classical Armenian words that had been used in print throughout the 19th century, the ultimate imprint of the Mkhitaryan monks who started it all, were retained and uh, dominated. They were supplemented by Armenian words from the dialect of Constantinople, which again was called urban educated speech. And then those gaps were filled with words, whatever was left over, the gaps were filled with words from provincial dialects. These were usually very specialized, very low frequency terms that have to do with rural life, agriculture, um, nature, and geography. They're often marked in dictionaries with a little keem for Kavaragan. Um, so they give you a, Kavaragan means provincial. So to give you a sense of the kinds of words that we find from there, there's a, um, a word for a place where, store, where hay is stored in the winter, or a word for a cut piece of leather used to make a certain kind of shoe. Very, very specific words. Okay, so the next phase in this project is understanding how Western Armenian spread as a spoken language in the post-genocide period. This framing goes against what we typically think of as uh, Western Armenian these days, as a victim, as an endangered language. But century, a century ago, it was a leveler. It was uh, the form that led to the extinction of many Ottoman Armenian dialects whose speakers abandoned them in favor of Western Armenian, especially in the Middle East. My research these days looks into how that complex process took place in hopes of understanding how the spread was carried out in such a short amount of time. I'm working on this project actively now, and I um, would love to hear from anyone listening with memories of Armenian dialects spoken in their home or anything ha that has to do with language in the first half of the 20th century. So I will leave it there with my plug. Thank you so much for your attention, and I look forward to your questions. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Jennifer. Um, what a fascinating talk. What a fascinating study. Um, I'm sure there are many of us who have questions. There are a few in the um, Q&A. Um, Peter, would you like to pose uh, the first question or one of the questions that we see? And I can take another one. Uh, well, actually, I have uh, one of my own, uh, which I think uh, may well be in the minds of many listeners, because uh, perhaps uh, in terms of uh, their overall perspective on the subject, uh, it may initially appear rather unexpected. 
Um, so perhaps, uh, 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 Dr. Manoukian, you might uh, unpack a little uh, for us uh, why it was that uh, Armenian was regarded as, quote unquote, inferior um, on the part of uh, many speakers in terms of their broader linguistic uh, uh, repertoire um, in the pre-modern period and uh, early modern period. Sure. So this really had to do with a very practical concern. This had to do with utility um, and partially how Armenian was taught in schools. So until until really the 18, the final decades of the 19th century, classical Armenian was the focus of Armenian education. So people had a really tough time uh, convincing parents to send their children to school to learn a language that would would really not help them make any money. <laughs> These people had very practical concerns. They had the concern of making a living. Uh, and Armenian didn't fit the bill. It didn't seem to lead them anywhere. So what I read a lot, I never read from the people who actually hold these beliefs. They're not the ones writing in the press. But I hear, uh, I read a lot of intellectuals citing a common uh, issue and then responding to it. So the common issue I hear is that Armenian just isn't, isn't useful. You can only use it among Armenians, um, and it's not going to fill the belly. That, that's what they say a lot. Uh, yes, uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, Jennifer. Um, another uh, question which uh, I, I think uh, a number of people are uh, curious about is, uh, you mentioned, of course, the process begins with the Mahitarists and their emphasis on uh, purity with regard to the, uh, the language. Um, so how would you uh, categorize their involvement, their participation, their whole project from a current perspective? So uh, viewing it more from um, uh, the level of scholarship now in the 21st uh, century. Uh, the amount of scholarship that we the, have on the, the, the role. So uh, fundamentally a current perspective on the achievement of the Mahitarists in this process from a contemporary perspective. Sure. So their uh, their work was was foundational. They didn't know what they clearly didn't know what was going to come. So when I uh, read their work from the late 18th century, they were really not in it to create a modern language. And throughout the 19th century, they're really the ones clinging the tightest to classical Armenian, all while the form that they inaugurated is in an opposite direction. So they laid the basis for the ideologies that we continue to have today, uh, in addition to the, the early building blocks of, of the Western Armenian that people use today. So they're really exceptional in that regard. Uh, there is uh, another question also uh, with regard to the uh, particular role in the late Ottoman period of uh, provincial dialects. Um, how significant uh, was this process, um, uh, particularly because it was uh, argued as being untouched by urban culture? So coming from a very, very different uh, level of the language than that which had been um, advanced earlier in the century. And um, how significant ultimately was its contribution in terms of uh, the Western meaning that uh, we see evolving um, in the late Ottoman period and on into the post-genocide period of today? Yeah, it had a very limited impact. There was a lot of uh, talk around the importance of dialects. There was a lot of uh, mobilization around collecting these words. These words were published in their own individual volumes. They flooded the press. Uh, people who were all, all segments of society. So you have students collecting lists and sending them to the capital to be published or sending them to Vienna to be published. You have um, trained philologists looking at the uh, compiling these lists. Uh, so it really runs the gamut. Priests were, were often, and teachers were often uh, these collectors and, and publishers, but um, ultimately those people didn't have control over what made it into dictionaries. The dictionaries were the creations of, of urbanites and urbanites harbored a lot of prejudice, which had been uh, nurtured over the course of the 19th century against the uneducated, against the provincial, against the person who wasn't uh, in touch with the outside world. 
So these two, this tension you you see in the press, you see uh, them understanding that the world is is valorizing the uneducated, but at the same time, they have those beliefs that are really hard to, to push down. The interesting part about the 1890s to the 19 uh, to 1915 is that you don't just hear the voices of the urban writer. You hear the voices of the people who are resisting and who are talking back and they're really contesting the, the way that they've been thought about for so long. And in that process, they're they're elevating their dialects, but but ultimately, the only word that I've come across that uh, that I knew and that's actually in use is the word for tomato. Low league comes from a comes from a dialect, and this mm-hmm. happens to be because uh, in the dialect of Constantinople, oh, first of all, the tomato is a new vegetable; it's a new world fruit, mm-hmm. so it wasn't in classical Armenian, it wasn't in any classical Armenian dictionaries. The word that's used in the spoken uh, variety of Constantinople to this day is the Turkish word domates. Uh, so what they did for the word tomato is they they picked a, a word that didn't originally mean tomato in a in a provincial dialect and they integrated it into into dictionaries and then from there it kind of took off. Uh, there is uh, quite an interest uh, in uh, pursuing the final part of your talk, uh, where you discuss uh, the impact of uh, Western Minion in the post-genocide period on into the modern era. And within that more uh, general uh, realm of discourse, there's a particular question uh, that is curious about um, the impact of West Armenian uh, within the Armenian Republic in terms of uh, a number of uh, movements of uh, West Armenian repatriation in the Republic and uh, what the impact of that is linguistically um, in, uh, in Armenia. If, if you could uh, address that. Sure, that's a fascinating question. And so far I haven't seen anything having to do with uh, linguistic history uh, it, as a result of those, those movements to Armenia, especially in the 1940s. And there was a lot of migration from the Eastern provinces of the empire to Armenia during the genocide. So it wasn't just in the 1940s that Armenia gets a, um, a flood of, of uh, Western Armenian dialect speakers. But uh, so far, my I? I haven't I haven't had a chance to touch on that. But it, it's really a, a fascinating topic, uh, not just for Armenian dialects, but many speakers of other languages from the Ottoman Empire make their way to Armenia. So Turkish speakers, Armenian Turkish speakers, end up in Armenia. Armenian Kurdish speakers end up in Armenia. I have a lot of questions about what became of them, what sorts of um, experiences they had, if there was a if there were prejudices that they faced, if they quickly shifted to Armenian or if they retained those language practices throughout their lives, it's a it's a topic ripe for exploration. Thank you. Perhaps I can offer a few of the questions that we have a large number of questions posed by our audience. We're grateful for them. Um, perhaps you could elaborate on how the Armenian writers and intellectuals who were from the uh, Ottoman provinces uh, even obtained their knowledge of printed modern Armenian to begin with and and how they possibly retained, as you mentioned, a few of the words um, from the local dialects. Yeah, so by the 1890s, uh, schools had been in effect in the provinces for a generation or so. So those intellectuals who were centered around Tolkat, Kharpert, these were, were people who were, were educated individuals. They were the ones who were receiving newspapers and books from um, publishing centers like Constantinople, Smyrna, Venice, and Vienna are the, are the major ones for Armenian print in the 19th century, uh, for Western Armenian print in the 19th century. So they were in touch with the outside world. They were reading the print language. They were, I have, I still have a lot of questions about education, uh, language education in the 19th century, uh, the late 19th century. It Part of me doesn't think that they were being taught Western Armenian in their schools in the 1870s and 1880s, but that it was more a sort of apprenticeship, a linguistic apprenticeship with the press. They were learning it more by osmosis and formally as they were reading. Um, It takes a really long time for 
Armenian, Western Armenian grammar to make its way into schools where it's taught as a separate subject. Um, and that doesn't seem to have happened mm -hmm. until the 1890s. So the way that they were uh, in touch with the outside world was through the press and through through books that would make their way uh, to their to their towns. Related to that, could you comment on the potential role that um, missionaries played, the you know American, German, et cetera, who knew Western Armenian? And when the Armenian Protestant Church was established in the mid 1800s, um, you know, lots of American hymns, for example, were translated into modern Western Armenian. And, and the schools that were established and so forth, was that relevant to the spread of what you're describing as modern Western Armenian into the provinces? Yeah, so the missionaries are crucial. The missionaries are crucial. Uh, they don't have the same kind of baggage that the Armenian intellectuals do in the mid 19th century. They're not really interested in classical Armenian because it uh, prevents your individual relationship with God. That's what they're coming to the the Ottoman Empire to preach so that there's no mediated there's no mediated um relationship. So in order to help people understand that tenant of of uh, Armenian Protestantism, they very, very quickly start producing books. So the missionaries arrive in the 1830s. By the late 1830s, they have a press and they are publishing a lot in what we would, if we picked up a, a missionary text from the late 1830s, it would look almost identical to, to a Western Armenian newspaper today. So they're printing in a spoken language, but they're printing in a purified spoken language. So there's still that element of um, awareness of the social context that they're existing in. And uh, it's not because the missionaries were very well <laughs> integrated into Armenian life. It's because they relied a lot on Armenian translators. They were coming from uh, my home state of New Jersey. They were coming from South Carolina. They were coming from all across New England, arriving to this new context and um, very quickly found people who were sympathetic to their way of thinking. Uh, there were many people that wanted a reform in the Armenian church in the 1830s and the early 1840s. So they found people who they could rely on as informants and who who they could rely on as um, interpreters and translators. So the history of Armenian Protestantism, the history of uh, missionary activity in the Ottoman Empire is absolutely not dissociated from this history, but it tends to be. It tends to be. Thank you. Peter, would you like to pose another question? Uh, yes, uh, there, there are uh, a number of others uh, that um, have uh, emerged. Uh, uh, one of them is uh, comparative. So um, obviously uh, you referred to a number of different languages and language communities in the Ottoman Empire. And uh, so that the question relates to parallel developments over the 19th century in terms of uh, cultural nationalism with regard to uh, Turkish and Kurdish. To what degree do we see similar movements uh, in terms then of uh, language purity uh, and uh, move towards the creation of a modern form of the language um, uh, in those uh, communities uh, as well? So I don't know much about Kurdish. I haven't seen anything written on it uh, in a language that I can read at least. Uh, Turkish and Greek in the Ottoman Empire are uh, experiencing similar kinds of, of movements. Their, their intellectuals are subject to the same ways of thinking that Armenian intellectuals are. The way that they go about it is obviously a little bit different. So Greek is the most is the most um, clear parallel with Armenian. They also have a kind of purified vernacular called Kafarevusa, and they have a demotic form of, of Greek. And uh, in the Greek case, the demotic form, so the one that is spoken and unpurified, is actually used for literary expression starting in the 1880s, which is very different from, mm -hmm. from mm -hmm. Armenian. We absolutely right. do not see anyone writing with Turkish borrowings. Um, 
So that kind of takes flight there. I haven't done too much comparative because there isn't tons that take a social approach. So there's a lot of philological work on these languages in the 19th century, uh, sometimes philological work done in the 19th century uh, on these languages, but those that are uh, socio-historical are few and far between, unfortunately. Mm. Uh, another uh, interesting question which is posed uh, relates to a parallel uh, literary form that was used by Armenians of the Ottoman Empire in the, uh, well, since the 17th century at least. Uh, so in parallel, of course, to the use of classical Armenian or perhaps the purified uh, uh, modern forms, we also have uh, the existence of Armeno Turkish, uh, so uh, Turkish in uh, Armenian letters. And of course, there's been a great deal of uh, investigation of this particular linguistic form uh, much more recently. So uh, the, the question relating to that is, um, how did composition in this form uh, become impacted by this uh, uh, cultural um, nationalism, the, uh, the, the whole process that uh, uh, you uh, addressed in your uh, presentation? Yeah, so our, the history of Armeno Turkish and the history of standard Western Armenian uh, are very much intertwined. Uh, at the outset, Armeno Turkish and the uh, form that the Mkhitaryan monks were developing were used for the same purpose. They were used to access people who weren't literate in classical Armenian. So you see the Mkhitaryans writing in Armeno Turkish, and you see similar texts being written in uh, in this new form. Armeno Turkish seems to have been much more popular, mm. <laughs> especially in the beginning, than um, than this. Uh, than, than Western Armenian, because there was a lot of education that needed to be done uh, for the reader. To read a newspaper in, in Western Armenian meant that you needed to be introduced to that classical word. And uh, I would imagine that many people just wanted the news. <laughs> they just wanted to read something that they could understand. So especially in the 1840s and 1850s, you see in newspapers, in the middle of a text on any old topic, you'll see the classical Armenian word, and then you'll see the Armeno Turkish next to it. So the implication is that the reader was more familiar with that Armeno Turkish. They were more familiar with the Turkish word that they likely used aloud, um, and they were seeing in Armeno Turkish newspapers uh, than they were with the Armenian. So it was a it was a way of it was a pedagogical tool. It was mm, a, tool a gloss, for, basically. Sorry. A gloss. A gloss. a gloss, yeah. So yeah. it's a gloss. Yeah. It's yeah. a gloss in Armeno Turkish. And you see that all the way through the 1860s. And then all of a sudden it switched to which you see glosses in French. You mm. see a meaning term, typically a technical term. And then you have the French next to it. The assumption being that the reader knows the French, mm. but doesn't know the Armenian. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, fascinating. Um, uh, one other uh, area that's been uh, posed, uh, clearly, of course, uh, we, we we see that uh, there's a similar sort of process, but again, uh, uh, naturally very distinct, uh, that emerges in uh, East Armenian. Um, so there, there is a question uh, relating to the role of purism more particularly in terms of the process of the creation of uh, modern East Armenian in parallel with Western. The assumption uh, uh, in the question is that uh, it appears that uh, it has played much less of a role in the East Armenian situation than uh, in the, uh, the, the Western that you have outlined. Yeah, I probably read the same secondary sources as the, uh, as the, the questioner. Uh, all of my knowledge comes from secondary sources uh, having to do with Eastern Armenian. The histories of Eastern and Western Armenian don't really intersect until probably about the 1880s, late 1870s, 1880s. The intellectuals that whose, whose uh, commentaries I'm reading rarely mention them. The, the, they're aware of, they're sometimes aware of persecution among uh, Armenian intellectuals whose sympathies they share in the Russian Empire, but there isn't any kind of collaboration. There isn't really much that uh, that unites them on the ground that um, uh, in the first part of the century. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it's a the history of Eastern Armenian also hasn't taken a turn to 
to the social. So we don't know very much about uh, that side yet. There is a graduate student in Michigan who's working on the social history of Eastern Armenian in the mm-hmm. in the late uh, 19th century. So hopefully we'll have some some uh, information soon. Excellent. Very that interesting. Sure, we we actually have a number of questions that uh, relate to um, any parallels that were seen in um, evolution of the Turkish language or the Kurdish language, uh, as uh, you have identified the uh, evolution toward modern Armenian language. Are you aware of any similar kinds of movements uh, in those languages? There, at the very end of the 1890s, there is a purification movement. Again, all of my knowledge comes from secondary sources. I didn't do uh, research into my own research in primary sources in Turkish. But from, from what I know from scholarship in the 1890s, there is what seems like a small scale Turkification movement uh, among Turkish intellectuals, uh, removing uh, Arabic and Persian and really trying to, to turn to folk language. But uh, again, that's not my area of expertise. Okay, very good. And a number of our um, questioners have asked about specific words that come from specific uh, Ottoman provinces and regions. Are there or did you identify some words that were prevalent in some regions versus others, or were they all, you know, fairly similar in terms of the Turkish words that were used, or possibly even evolving from Persian? So, in some of the glossaries, uh, they do break them down by by place, but again, not all of the words in the glossaries made them into dictionaries. So the the composers of those glossaries were giving sort of raw material to lexicographers, or they were envisioning that they they were giving raw material to lexicographers to then be integrated into those uh, bilingual and monolingual Western Armenian dictionaries. When they, when some of them do make it into the dictionaries, we lose any information about, about where it comes from. So again, my study is sort of a bird's eye view. I'm not looking at individual words, but if the person who asked the question is interested in uh, in words from a specific dialect, they're welcome to write to me and I can send them some of the, the glossaries that I found from different regions. Very good, thank you. Um, there are also a number of questions that you uh, have already touched on a bit, and that is the origin of Eastern Armenian as distinct from Western Armenian. And, um, you know, maybe you or possibly even Professor Cowie could just in a nutshell, um, educate us on that. Um, So again, Eastern Armenian isn't my specialty, but uh, Eastern Armenian likely came about in, so in the 19th century, many uh, languages are, there are many movements towards creating modern languages. Uh, so we heard what happened in the Ottoman case, and there must be a parallel movement in the in the Russian Empire, again, at the level of the intelligentsia, but the specifics I don't know. Thank you. Okay, Peter, do you have any comments or other um, questions you'd like to well, pose? So uh, one of the things which I think is uh, very striking is that... Um, the um, situation of uh, standard modern Eastern Armenian uh, in many ways has been uh, much more contested uh, than its uh, Western Armenian uh, counterpart. Um, fundamentally, we see that uh, there's a great use, uh, literary use of dialect uh, in the East. So, for example, particularly the dialect of uh, Tiflis, of uh, Tbilisi uh, in the 19th century. There are all sorts of materials written in that. Um, and uh, I, I think that uh, one point which is very striking is that uh, basically the, the, the grammar, the structure of uh, modern Eastern Armenian is developed actually in the Eastern Armenian diaspora in uh, in Moscow, fundamentally through the pages of the Husisapayal, a particular uh, periodical that was uh, developed there for about uh, eight years uh, by Stepanos Nazarian and uh, Mikhail Nalbandian. 
And uh, of course, uh, one, one of the key issues, which I think is enormously important with regard to that is uh, the uh, uh, interrelation that it's had throughout its uh, history, particularly uh, in the 20th century with the role of uh, Russia, obviously in the uh, late Russian empire, and then of course in the Soviet Union. So I, I think that uh, what we're seeing in the current period is a, a real flourishing of the opportunity of uh, uh, modern East Armenian to, to develop within the post-Soviet uh, Republic. Thank you. Uh, let's see, are there any other questions you'd like to pose, Peter? I think most of them we have captured, but again, if, if not, um, these questions will eventually be transmitted to uh, Dr. Manukian and um, she, may be able to respond to them if, if uh, she's able to. Um, let's see, any anything uh, I, else? I, I do have yeah. actually uh, one which is uh, interesting because uh, we, to, to some degree, have skirted it uh, in some of the uh, discussion already, but uh, not uh, presented it uh, directly. Um, so the issue is uh, fundamentally uh, relating to the um, interrelation, uh, the, the comparative significance, basically, of uh, classical Armenian and uh, the modern purified form of the language um, in the second half of the 19th century. And so the questioner is asking, when do we actually see uh, the this uh, modern purified language uh, infiltrating the schools? And um, uh, the second part of the question is, so uh, obviously, as you indicated, uh, by the end of this period, fundamentally, I was going to say pure, uh, traditional classical Armenian is left, of course, uh, as the domain of the church. And so uh, the uh, questioner is also curious about the fact that, uh, so um, how did the church regard uh, this uh, development in terms then of the language used in schools? So that, of course, it's no longer going to be classical Armenian. So what was the reaction uh, within the, the, uh, the, the clergy? So uh, schools seem to be the last bastion of classical mm. Armenian. It's where it clings on the longest. And uh, I just finished up an article on this uh, that I couldn't fit into the dissertation. Uh, and it seems like over the course of the 1880s, there's more talk about integrating the study of modern Armenian grammar in schools. Even in the late, uh, even in the early 1890s, we know from memoirs of, of students at the time that they didn't have any modern Armenian instruction. They were still being taught classical Armenian grammar. By the end of the 1890s, this changes. And we see that uh, because there are tons of Armenian, uh, modern Armenian grammar books that come out. Mm. And we learn this from memoirs too. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, and then what was the reaction of the church to that? Oh, I haven't looked at that yet. Uh -uh. Uh -uh. I do want to uh, address one thing that's come up in, in the chat. So mm -hmm. people are talking about the origins of, of Eastern Armenian. From this study, it's very clear to me that there is a lot that we don't know about. So there were a lot of misconceptions about Western Armenian uh, that I had internalized starting out researching this topic. So there's a lot in the secondary scholarship these days um, and in the past that we sort of have um, internalized and are repeating. But I think that the history of Eastern Armenian needs to be studied mm. just as rigorously in mm. the sources mm. um, before we can come down definitively and talk about the... Uh, exact history of this language. People need to study it more uh, before we can before we can say exactly what was going on. A lot of times modernization processes from other situations have been imposed in historiography on Armenian. And when we look at the sources, that's not what we're seeing. So, or that's not what I saw in my study. And my inclination is to say that uh, it's a similar case for, for, um, for Eastern Armenian. The, the big, the, the, there's a lot of nuance that needs to be fleshed out. Mm. And um, yeah, I'll, I'll leave it there. Very That's good. Fine. Perhaps I can ask just one more question. Um, uh, given how much influence French literature and intellectual culture has had on Western Armenian, 
Um, do you see influence from the French Academy with its focus on monitoring and promoting the purity of the French language, on language ideology um, and approach of the architects of Western Armenian? Were there was there an influence from the French in this way? Oh, definitely. Yeah, for for decades, these intellectuals were trying to create the uh, Armenian Académie Française. They talked about it endlessly. There were starts and stops. There was one for a couple of months in the 1870s, and then, as usual, these these things kind of disintegrate. So they were very aware of language academies, and people really wanted to organize one, but. Um, it never worked out. But we do see influence of French uh, just because so many of these intellectuals were one of their second languages, third languages was French, and that was often the language that they were reading literature in most. So in the 1890s, uh, 1880s, 1890s, and, and into the 20th century, you see a lot of uh, you see a lot of thinking in French and and writing in Armenian, a lot of calques, a lot of uh, parallel, expressions from French into, into Armenian. So it's, it's definitely, definitely an influence. Fascinating. Okay. Uh, I think we are pretty much at our end. Uh, is Peter, did you want to ask any further questions or? Yeah. Uh, no, I, I think we've, uh, we've covered most of those that we've okay. uh, received. Yes. Yes. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jennifer. And thank you to, uh, Dr. Ka Peter Cowie, but also to our audience for this extensive engagement. Um, this was a fascinating uh, and very stimulating presentation and discussion. And Jennifer, we wish you all the best in your continued research activities at UC Irvine and beyond. Thank you. So let me uh, close our webinar now by noting that uh, the Promise Armenian Institute, as well as our partner in, uh, institutions, have a number of events that are of interest that are scheduled in the near future. Uh, we encourage you to consult our website and social media to learn more about them. So, for example, next Tuesday, October 17 at 7 p.m. Pacific Time, UCLA is honored to host an evening with Mr. Gato Pailan, who until recently was among the very few ethnic Armenians to be elected a member of the Turkish parliament. Mr. Pailan will speak on Armenian rebirth, the last plight. This event is co-sponsored by the Center for Truth and Justice and will be held in person at our UCLA Hmong Conference Center but will also be available remotely via the Zoom webinar and YouTube platforms. On Wednesday, November 1st at 6 p.m. Pacific, we are honored to host the world premiere of a recently discovered lost film entitled Jackie in the Near East. This is a 1924 short film produced by Near East Relief and featuring the then child star Jackie Coogan, who helped raise millions of dollars in America for orphans of the Armenian Genocide. This event is co-sponsored by the Armenian Film Foundation and our good friend Carla Karapetian, and will also be held in person at our UCLA Hmong Conference Center, and of course will also be available remotely via Zoom and YouTube. After this, we anticipate hosting a couple of book talks later in the fall quarter by well-known scholars. On Wednesday, November 15 at 10 a.m. Pacific, we will be hosting a Zoom-based lecture by Professor Elise Samerjan of Clark University on her recently published book, Remnants, Embodied Archives of the Armenian Genocide, and then later on Tuesday, November 28 at 6 p.m. Pacific, we'll be hosting a, a hybrid lecture, both in person and on Zoom by Professor Sebu Aslanian of UCLA on his recently published book, Early, Early Modernity and Mobility, Port Cities and Printers Across the Armenian Diaspora. And finally, before closing, we'd also like to offer our grateful thanks to our hardworking staff in the Promise Armenian Institute, 
Deputy Director Hasmik Bagdasarian and our Program Assistant Emily Palosian, who have worked energetically and effectively in coordinating this event. So thank you once again to all of you for your attendance at this webinar, and we look forward to having you participate in future events for the Promise Armenian Institute at UCLA.